Welcome back. The NBA playoffs are really heating up and the matchups are becoming even more intense. Yeah, you know, and to preview possible second round matchups, we welcome in our good friend Adam Wexer of Sports Talk 790 AM. Wex, thanks for stopping by. My pleasure. Now let's start with the number one seed, San Antonio Spurs, who have their hands full with the number eight seeded Memphis Grizzlies. Now how much trouble are these Spurs in and how would either one of these teams potentially match up with Oklahoma City? Well, we only need to worry about how Memphis matches up with Oklahoma City. That's how much trouble the San Antonio Spurs are in. I didn't expect it to be quite this easy for Memphis. I thought it would go seven games. I thought the matchup was great. It did kind of seem like Memphis wanted this matchup, and you can see why. They played them well during the season. They are very big and very physical up front, a great rebounding team with Gasol and Randolph, and the Spurs just aren't anymore. I mean, Tim Duncan isn't what he used to be. They're getting nothing out of any of their other bigs, McDice, Blair, Splitter, they're basically zeros. And the worst part is Mike Conley's out playing Tony Parker. So they, they just have gotten beaten when the games are on the line and the last time out to get blown out in the second half. Pretty surprising, but uh, you know, watching these eight games they've now played against one another this year, Memphis has actually proven to be the better team. They just have to be that one more time, and I definitely think they will. Now the Miami Heat will be facing the Celtics in the second round. The Celtics have been up and down since the Kendrick Perkins trade, but they looked convincing in finishing off the Knicks. Now, Adam, do you think the Seas have regained their championship form? Yeah, it's been a big topic on our show about the Celtics and what they did exactly to the Knicks. They were going to beat the Knicks no matter what. It became a no contest when the Knicks were no longer the Knicks. You take three good players, Billups, Stoudemire, Carmelo, take two of them away, they're not going to beat anybody. They weren't very good to begin with, and they were no challenge for the Celtics after both of those guys were either out or relegated to not nearly as successful, as healthy as they needed to be. Celtics were lucky to, to play well enough late to beat the Knicks in the first two games, but that's what's good about the Celtics. If they're in a close game, it's very hard not to favor them to be the team to make the right plays, make the big shots. They got four different guys they can turn to to create a great play. That's what makes them tough to pick against. But as long as Miami, if they get by Philadelphia, which they will, uh, doesn't leave themselves in that position, uh, that's what makes that matchup so great. Miami needs to win these games comfortably to beat the Celtics, which I think they will do. And that just means they can't have a one possession game. You've got the Celtics, who are probably the best in the league at finishing, and the Heat, who might actually be the worst in the league at finishing. So I can't wait to see how that matchup plays out if they have close games. And if they do, I don't think the Celtics are going to beat them. But if those scenarios play out, Celtics stand a pretty good chance. Now let's talk Rockets, Wex. As you know, the Rockets and their coach, Rick Edelman, decided to mutually part ways, which we both know was a firing, but they're not going to say. Now there's several names that have been floated out there. You've got the Van Gundy, Stan, and Jeff. Larry Brown, Mike Brown, Mario Ellie, and recently Kelvin Sampson, formerly of the Oklahoma Sooners. Going forward, what does this coach, this team need in a coach? That's a great question. What do they need from a coach when they let go of a coach who they all think did a great job? And I think a lot of us think he did a, you know, a fantastic job during his time here in Hall of Fame is awaiting Rick Adelman. They need a coach to work with a little bit better players. They need a coach who can convince the guys they have and hopefully the guys they get that they still have to play significantly better defense. I don't think Rick Adelman discounted it. I just think he utilized his players to just simply outscore other teams. They made so many defensive mistakes, and some of that's on the coaching. The most of that is still on the players that they have. They, they've acquired players that are better offensive players and that haven't been forced to play better defense in order to keep their minutes, and that's just based on the roster that they have. I kind of think they, they're, they're going to be like Mike. I kind of think they're going to hire a coach named Mike. As silly as that may sound, they got like four different candidates named Mike, all of whom would make for great head coaches. And this is the biggest list of coaching candidates a team could possibly have, and they're already getting started on the interviews. But I think the coach they have will be fine. I don't think that's what would hold them back. And as they say, let's grade the results and not the press conference. It's still fun to grade the press conference. Let's go ahead and make our decision early. I like their candidates, so I think they're going to make a good decision. But the new coach, the old coach, the last coach, 10 coaches from now, it doesn't really matter unless they get more talent. Now, GM Daryl Morey, he's looking for a coach, but he also has other important decisions to make, including what to do with Yao Ming, who's a free agent. How do you see the Yao Ming free agency situation playing out? Now, they've got to go after somebody else first. They've got to convince some free agent center, uh, some trade commodity, uh, you know, that they can go ahead and acquire to play that position, to be the new starting center. Uh, the starting center for the Rockets for 2011 and moving forward hopefully was not on last year's roster. Not Chuck Hayes, as much as we love Chuck Hayes, 
not Brad Miller, not Jordan Hill, and not Yao Ming. I'm fine if he turns into that, but he's basically starting all over again. And again, I'm okay with them re-signing him. I hope he's willing to take very little money. He's already stolen money from them for the last two years, having not been able to play. I hate to describe it as such, but I think you get the gist. Uh, he needs to accept a very low deal. I'd love it for to be veterans minimum, but I bet you he, that won't happen. He's got to go in as the backup. They've got to go in expecting nothing. A healthy Yao is a healthy player, a helpful player, but they cannot count on him for anything. I'll advocate bringing him back at low money and with, n n with no need whatsoever to count on him. Now let's move on to the gridiron. Now you got the draft, which will be taking place this week, and the talk of this past season has been Wade Phillips and his 3-4 defense. Now give us a few names the Texans could or should draft who you think that would fit into this Phillips scheme. Someone who likes to get after the ball, whether it's in the back end of the secondary or someone up front, to get to the quarterback. He's taking over a terrible defense. He's going to have a better defense. And there's plenty of guys available at 11 or maybe a little ahead, maybe even a little behind. They have traded back several times during this regime, and it wouldn't even shock me if they did it again once they dropped out of the top 10, winning their last game of the season. But you know, Robert Quinn's a guy that I like. I don't think he's going to be on the board at 11 defensive end outside linebacker here with Houston most likely in the new 3-4. Didn't play last year for Carolina because of uh, the NCAA issues, but I, I still think he's the most explosive player that's likely available to them. Would love to see him trade up. Patrick Peterson, Von Miller, probably the two best can't-miss defensive players in this draft. Both would fit here. Neither likely to be there at 11. So starting with Quinn, who could be there. I'm going to guess he's off the board by seven. Uh, moved down the board to Alden Smith, kid out of Missouri. Also had issues staying on the field last year, but that was because of a broken leg. A real good disruptor, a little stiff, but I feel like he could help this team tremendously off the edge. Amukamara, Prince from Nebraska in the secondary. Probably the only cornerback I'd consider in, in even the top 15, and they're at 11, so I, I could see them moving on. One other name, I'm not... In, totally on board with him at 11, but I think a lot of other people are, and all that matters is what the Texans like, and that's the defensive end from uh, Wisconsin, J.J. Watt. Uh, if you look at a guy's draft evaluation, sometimes you'll see in there, we'll take a playoff, needs to be motivated, not a high motor. Exact opposite for J.J. Watt. He'll be probably the highest energy guy on this entire team, and, and that's a huge positive for him. Now, a district judge has just granted the player's request for an injunction to lift the lockout. The owners could stand to lose $400 million a week if there is a work stoppage. So Adam, how do you see this whole situation playing out? I, I'm maybe the most naive guy around or maybe the most hopeful guy around. I think we got a 20 game schedule in front of us for preseason, 16 game regular season and playoffs without interruption. I think this ruling just indicates the, the owners have got to become more serious about accepting a deal that the players have presented them or more negotiations need to take place. There's going to be a deal. It's just a matter of when, even though they got out of this deal early, at some point this deal was going to run out. And that was only a couple years down the road anyway. They have to sit down. They have to legitimately negotiate. They have to realize what they're asking for is, is still too much. It's nice to have a safeguarded business, but they already have that. It's the NFL. It is a safeguarded business. You're going to do fine. You're thriving, actually. Revenue is sky high. Everything is sky high. They're just trying to figure out how to divvy up the pie, and asking for all these off-the-top monies is just a little much. The players have a sound position. The legal system sees it that way, and, and I don't see how they could have that overturned. You know, the stay that they've been talking about, the lockout lifted. I hope this pushes them back to the table. They still have to negotiate. I still don't think this gets decided in the courts. I think they finally sit down and, and get it done. But I, it's not like I see an end in sight. I just still believe the season can be played without interruption. Adam, as always, thanks for coming by. I hope that's what I'm right on. The other stuff, be nice. Please let me be right on the NFL having a full season. Now, when we return, we're going to talk about the Dynamo. So keep it right here.